Well, good morning, church. Why don't you stand? Let's make a joyful noise to our Lord and King. Hey!
Nothing compares. 
you give them a little wave. Thank you so much for being with us in church today.
Well, hey there, everyone. My name is Brittany. Welcome to Living Stones Church. Whether you are here with us in person or tuning in on our live stream, we want to connect with you. We invite you to fill out a connect card to send us your prayer requests. Let us know if you are new or if you would like more information about Living Stones Church. Connect cards can be picked up in the foyer or at the church office and dropped off at the office or in the slot at the information center. You can also fill them out online at livingstones.ab.ca slash connect. If you would like to give today, you can do so at the church office right after the service. For more information on all of our giving options, including e-transfers, click the give button on our website. You are invited to celebrate the birth of our Savior with us. Join us in person or online for our Christmas Eve services on December 24th at 2, 345, 530, and 715 p.m. Pre-registration is required for our in-person services, and if all of our four services in the sanctuary are full, you are welcome to register for our overflow option in the Fellowship Hall. For more information, go to our website or call the church office. At Living Stones Church, we are committed to each other and to learning and growing in our spiritual walks. To find out what's happening at LSC, check out the 2021 Winter Preview on our website. There is something for everyone. One of the beautiful things about being part of a church family is that you don't have to do life alone. At Living Stones Church, we love gathering together and supporting each other in prayer. Start the new year right by joining us for three nights of prayer and fasting starting on January 11th from 7 to 8.30 p.m. each night in the sanctuary and online. Well, hey, thanks again for hanging out with us this weekend. If you have questions about anything you've heard today or just want to find out more about LSC, stop by the church office or visit us online. And if you are new here, we want you to feel right at home. We invite you to stop by the guest reception kiosk after the service. We have a gift for you and we would love to meet you. On behalf of the leadership and staff of Living Stones Church, we wish all of you a Merry Christmas. Well, good morning. So good to see you here. And for those of you that I cannot see but are watching and listening in, welcome to our services this morning. Just want to tell you, man, Christmas is right around the corner. Christmas Eve is Thursday. All four services are full. So if you want to come, you have to register to go to the fellowship hall, okay? But there'll be a huge screen there, and you won't be alone. There'll be other people there, all right? So we're just excited about that, and I'm going to have you turn in your Bibles this morning to Luke's Gospel again. We're going to turn to chapter 1. I'm still stuck in chapter 1, and uh, while you're turning there, why don't we stand together as we go to the Lord in prayer. We're just going to believe God today for just, uh, as you look at my title, there's something to sing about, you know, and I've been thinking about all the reasons why people could be down right now. Isn't that true? And I think a lot, there's a lot of heavy hearts right now, but I'll just say this, that you and I have something to sing about, and we're going to hear that this morning. So let's pray. Father, I just want to thank you this morning. You are so amazing. We had so much fun already just worshiping you, praising you, singing uh, songs of adoration. I just thank you for uh, those that are serving in our church family, so many committed people, Lord. They just make all of these things happen. And we just thank you for them, Lord, as we work together, we labor together, Lord. Now I just pray that your Holy Spirit would just come and just uh, hover in our souls, Lord. I just pray that there'd be an openness to your word. I pray, Father, that we would leave here today filled with hope, filled with joy, filled with adoration, Lord, with just a sense, Lord, of expectation, because we know that the days of COVID are going to come to an end. We know that uh, there's a new season around the corner, Father, we thank you for that. And Lord, we're believing for all of those that are sick and afflicted. We pray for your mighty move of your spirit in their bodies, that you would touch them and encourage them and strengthen them and raise them up, Father, and we just thank you for that in Jesus' name. And God's people said, amen. 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 You may be seated. How many know that music is 
phenomenal as a tool to help people actually connect to God. How many realize that? Music is a great tool. I still remember years ago when I was in, uh, working on my bachelor's degree, just a young person, and one of the classes, we actually had a music class in Bible college. Isn't that good? It's good for all of us. And I still remember something that my, my teacher said at that time, and she said this, music has the ability to transcend our minds and speak right into our spirit. Is it any wonder that music fills the pages of Scripture? Now, you may not know that, but uh, you may be surprised to discover that singing is supposed to be a huge element in the Christian life. Let me give you an example. Here's the Apostle Paul writing to the church at Colossae, and he says this, let the word of Christ dwell in you richly. How many think that's an important thing, that God's word just you know, soaks into the very fabric of our being, starts renewing our mind, helps us to focus a little differently. How many have a sense that what we tend to do as human beings is focus on our problems? Isn't that true? How many say that's true? And what that does is weigh us down. But listen to what he says. He says, let this word of Christ dwell in you richly as you teach and admonish one another with all wisdom and as you sing psalms, hymns, and spiritual songs with gratitude in your hearts to God. Now, how many know that if you start singing praises and thanksgiving with gratitude in your heart to God, something happens in your spirit? Something happens in your innermost being. Your, your soul begins to lift up, even though your outward circumstances may not be changed, but that's what starts happening. It was said of Leo, uh, Pope Leo X that the thing that he feared most regarding the Reformation under Martin Luther was not so much his preaching, but the songs that people were singing. Why was he concerned about that? Because in the songs, there was great theology. And how many know that when you get a tune stuck in your head, the words just keep coming? Coming, and people were remembering the theology because of the music. So singing and music is so critical. And I think one of the great things about Christmas is the songs of Christmas. How many love Christmas carols? I love them. And you know, many times you hear the gospel so powerfully communicated in Christmas carols. And uh, as we're about to see, G. Campbell Morgan said this about the Gospel of Luke. You know, Luke, he says, is the only one who's recorded for us this outburst of poetry and music. Because that's what music is. All the lyrics are poetic. They're, they're speaking powerfully. And he says they're, they're in connection with this God coming and becoming a man. God coming in the flesh. Matthew does not tell us anything about songs. But he goes on to say here, Luke, the Greek uh, the artist himself, a poet, as well as a scientific man, when he was investigating and getting these stories, obtained copies of these amazing songs. And he says, from him we gain the beatitude of Elizabeth, the magnificent of Mary, the benedictus of Zacharias, and the nun Demetus of Simeon. And the evangel sung by the angels of the Lord over those plains where the shepherds were listening and the gloria of the angelic host. Luke the artist has gathered under the guidance of the Holy Spirit those stories that speak of the coming of Jesus into our world and it's expressed in music. So all of these expressions in Luke 1 and 2, most of them are songs. How many think that's neat? And so these are gonna, we're going to look at one today. Mary's response to being chosen by God. She bursts into song. Really, it's poetry, and, and that's what we need to understand. That Matter of fact, that word magnificent in the Latin means praise. She's beginning to praise God. How many think that's probably the right response to when God reveals himself to us, that we burst forth into praise? And that's exactly what she does. She's filled. But what I notice is that she's bursting forth in song, or what she's saying about, it's filled with the word of God. And that's one of the reasons why we need to be so full of the Word of God, you know, that these things flow out of our innermost being. So today I want to focus in on really three reasons um, for us to sing. Because some of us might be saying, you know, in light of all that we're going through right now, Pastor, and all of the heaviness and the COVID and the restrictions and no family and on, and we could make a whole list of things of all the reasons why we shouldn't be singing 
I want to give you three reasons why we should. Because I think as believers, we have something to sing about. And when you and I start singing the song, then the other things begin to find their proper place in our lives. Because what God has given us, what God has for us, is far greater than the challenges that you and I are experiencing in this life. And I believe that the first reason is that we're to rejoice in our salvation. There's probably no greater joy than to know God. There's no greater joy. There's no more, no, nothing that's more exciting. There's nothing that brings greater peace. There's nothing that brings greater hope in our lives. You know, we have an amazing hope. We, we can look forward to so many incredible things. And, uh, but I think one of Satan's strategies is to get us focused on our problems. How many think that's probably true? And uh, he might keep us busy with problems, but you know what? Greater is he that is in us than he that is in the world. You know, we have a God that's greater than our problems. We need to learn how to lay those things at his feet. We need to recognize that all things are working together for good. And even the things that we look at and go, I can't figure out how this is going to work out for good, Pastor. This makes no sense to me. And I can join you in those times when I've looked at things and I said, I don't get how this works. But you know, in hindsight or in eternity, we're going to be able to look back and say, wow, God was so good, taking us right on through those things and developing some incredible stuff inside of our souls. I want you to notice uh, what happened in Mary's response to God's promises. And I would even encourage us that if you're a little bit discouraged today, I want you to begin to sing. I want you to start making this as part of a strategy in your life, that whenever you get a little heavy, whenever you feel overwhelmed, whenever you feel discouraged, I want you to learn how to sing praises to God. And something's going to happen on the inside of you. Notice uh, Mary's song selection, if I can say it that way. She just breaks in the psalm. Here, a psalm uh, in, in Luke chapter 1 and verse 46, and then Mary says, my soul glor glorifies the Lord. And my spirit rejoices in God, my Savior. So first of all, I want you to notice that Mary is responding from her innermost being. This is a deep uh, response from inside of her soul. Her soul sings out. She's deeply aware of her need for a Savior. Notice how she says that. She says, my soul glorifies Yahweh, and my spirit rejoices in God, my Savior. Notice she personalizes it. God is her Savior. And that's what you and I can rejoice about, the fact that God is our Savior. That's probably the greatest gift, that you and I can declare that. God, you are my God. God, you are my Savior. You're the one that delivers me from all my fears. You're the one that delivers me from my sin and my shame. And so she recognizes you know this, that she herself is in need of a savior from sin. And what love and kindness for God to come to earth and save us. You know, the other night, Patty, my wife and I were, you know, we were doing our devotional time together and we're reading a little devotional. We pray together and we pray for you as a congregation. And uh, it's in the middle of this devotional, the writer said this, and I don't know the name of the devotional, you know, when it's one of those ones on your Bible app. And he said this, that God is not in the business of meeting our expectations. Rather, he's in the business of blowing them out of the water. Now, how many like that? You know, God's not just interested in meeting them. He's interested in blowing them out of the water. And then he says this. He said, the example, he goes on, he says, he is in the business of meeting needs we don't even know we have. How many like that? I love that. And then he shares this insight, and, and this is where he gets this idea from. He, he cited the example of the Jewish people's expectation of a Messiah in the first century. You know what they were believing for? That they would be liberated from Roman oppression. But you know, that's a temporary solution, because eventually you die, and what's, what's the end of it? That's the end of your, your life, right? That would be a very earthly, limited deliverance. But God, when he came, had something far more significant in mind that would transform not only that first century, but for all centuries and for all times. When he, what he had in mind was he was going to deliver all of humanity from all of our sins and reunite us to God in all of eternity. How many think that's very significant? I love that. I just put down, wow. <laughs> with a big exclamation point, right? 
How many think that's pretty impressive? I mean, he wasn't just messing around saying, I'll just take care of a, you know, uh, an immediate problem. Isn't that kind of where we're at? Lord, deliver me from my immediacy. Lord, deliver me from the problem that I have right at the moment. God says, no, i got a bigger plan. I'm going to deliver whatever's going on for all of eternity. That's pretty good. I like it. You'll take it. Titus says this, but when the kindness and the love of God our Savior appeared, he saved us not because of some righteous thing we've done. It's not because of our goodness. It's not because we did all the right things. But because of his mercy, he saved us through the washing of rebirth and the renewal of the Holy Spirit, whom he poured out on us generously through Jesus Christ our Savior. So that having been justified, justified means so that you and I now are in a right standing with God. You and I are in a right place with God, okay? By his grace. Grace means something I didn't deserve, I didn't earn, it's a gift. It's unmerited favor. That we might become heirs having the hope of eternal life. How many think that's an amazing hope? That you and I are living with the hope of eternal life. That you and I are possessors of eternal life. Actually, if you and I have the Son of God in our lives, we have eternal life. We're living in that. We're We're living in this hope, but eventually it will no longer be hope when you and I are in his presence because then it will be hope realized. And once you have it, it's no longer having to hope for it. You actually have it. And that's what we're moving towards. I love that. You know, I think we must ever remind ourselves that all of our giving to God is in itself nothing we can add to him as God. C.S. Lewis kind of reminds us of this. He says this, all of our offerings, whether of music or martyrdom, are like the intrinsically worthless present of a child. How many have ever had a present, a little kid makes something for you? It doesn't really have a lot of value except for what? It's because of who gave it to you, right? That's what makes it valuable to you. That's the way it is with God. He says, intrinsically worthless present of a child, which a father loves indeed, but values only for the intention. What God sees is the heart. Isn't that a, I love that statement, and it's so true. There's nothing that you and I can give that will ever enrich God. How many know that's true? Everything that you give to God, he gave to you first. You're never really giving him anything, and yet we are giving him something, you know, because he has everything he needs. The thing that he delights in is our response to him. The thing that he longs for is that you and I will love him. Isn't that what God really wants? And love is a gift of the will. And so when you and I respond back to him and give him our love, that's the thing that blesses his heart so much. You know, the question is, will we serve him? Will we worship him with all of our heart? Is our hearts filled to overflowing towards him? I believe that's what really blesses his heart. So when he's sitting here today listening to our praise and worship with all the angels in heaven, we're joining this amazing host as we're worshiping God. And God just loves the fact that you and I love him. And we do it out of a free heart, you know, out of the freedom of our soul. It's so beautiful. Mary worshiped because of the child that was to be born within her. Think of it, Christ in her. You know, this child that was going to develop in her was actually created by God. The Holy Spirit overshadowed her, put the seed within her womb. You know, Christ was being formed within her. And then I want you to think of something. Isn't that a beautiful picture of what happens to you and I when we receive Christ into our lives and we accept him by faith? Listen to what the Apostle Paul says in Colossians chapter 1 and verse 27. To them God has chosen to make known among the Gentile the glorious riches of this mystery, which is what? Christ in you, the hope of glory. Christ in you. I remember that when this became a living reality to me. You know, when I realized, when I, when I asked Jesus into my life, something profound happened. I, it, it hit me one day. I was thinking about it. God, the, the one whom the universe cannot contain, now has chosen to live inside of my life. I, I, I was overwhelmed. I was overwhelmed with that thought that Christ is now living within us. How many think that's in a marvelous thing that God would decide to live within you and within me. Who are we, right? And that's what Mary's saying in this this beautiful song. Who am I, Lord, that you would choose me? Isn't that great? I love that. And that's, 
you know, that's her experience. Though Mary's experience is a little different than ours, she literally had Christ being formed physically in her body, but you and I have that happening to us spiritually. I think to grasp the truth of that reality, that we are the people of God's presence. He is not only with us, that's what the word Emmanuel means, God with us, but that he's God within us now. Isn't that beautiful? I, I say this, you know, He is not only with us, but within us. Christianity is more than just propositional truth. It's subjective. It's something you and I have to experience. It's not just about knowing God, but it's living with him. It's it's really developing a relationship with him. It's knowing him personally. This incredible passage in the book of Ephesians dealing with marriage. I love that. You know, we study Probably the one we cite the most about marriage is Ephesians chapter 5. You know, husbands love your wife. Wives be submissive to your husbands. But Paul says, I want to tell you a mystery. This isn't really about marriage. Marriage is just an analogy. I'm speaking about Christ and the church. Isn't that beautiful that Christ is with us, that there's a union that's going on, that, that you know, that picture in the garden when, when he said that it was not good that man would be alone and he created out of Adam, Eve, right? And the two became one. There's a sense that God wants to have union a, a, and relationship with you and with me. As a matter of fact, Jesus in this high priestly prayer in John 17 says, I have made you known to them. He's talking to his father. And will continue to make you known in order that the love you have for me may be in them. The love that the Father has for Jesus the Son is now living inside of us. That same love. Isn't that beautiful? The fruit of the Spirit is what? Love. The result of the Spirit of God living inside of us is love. How can the world know that you and I are followers of Christ, that we have love one for another? And that I myself may be in them, Jesus says. Another element regarding this expression of praise is that Mary was able to sing before it happened. How many think that's impressive? You know, she was singing at the promise, not the reality of it. Do you see the difference? Sometimes, you know, in life, you and I can do a jig or a dance or a hoot or a holler when we have an answer. How many ever get excited when God answers prayer and something wonderful happens? Isn't that easy? How many say it's really easy to sing then? Isn't that true? Anybody can sing that, but how about singing when God makes a promise to you and it's not reality yet, but you and I decide, I'm going to sing right now because God said it. You see, I am so convinced that if God says it, it will become a reality. How powerful is that? How many realize, as I said, it's one thing to sing when the promises of God are realized and quite another to sing when we're living in the hope and promise of their fulfillment. I like what Charles Spurgeon, that great 19th century British preacher said, there's a song to be sung when, God's, when God promises and another song to be sung when God answers. Mary was singing for the promise to come. We can sing uh, in that the promise has come. He has come to us personally. We have experienced the reality of this thing. We also discovered that the song is personal. Listen to how Mary expresses her song. My soul, my spirit glorifies and rejoices in God, my Savior. You can only sing the song of Mary if Christ is real to you. You can't sing the song if you don't know Christ. But you and I can join her in this song if we've given our lives to Christ. So we might ask why we would burst in the song of Christ be within us, because as Spurgeon put out, singing is the natural language of joy. How many know that if you see somebody whistling down the road, you go, what's he so happy about? Isn't it kind of the first thing out of her mouth? Or someone singing away, you know, washing the dishes or doing something, you go, you know, like the first thing you say to somebody, what are you so happy about? That's the point, that you and I as believers, we have a song. We have a song to sing. And I want to just make a statement. Some of the greatest music comes out of the church. As a matter of fact, most of what the world, you know, all the music that's coming, a lot of those people, first of all, came from the church. It's amazing how music is so dynamically a part of the life of the community of faith. Let me move on to the second reason for us to sing. It's our recognition of our exaltation. God is the one who lifts us up. He elevates us. He picks us up. God does not come to us because we are special. Rather, in coming to us, God makes us special. Do you see the difference? 
You see, I think sometimes when we look at the story, and I said it last week, we think, oh, you know, Mary must have done something special to warrant this great honor. I'm saying no. What happened was God chose an ordinary person and made her special. And you know, God comes to us who are very ordinary people, and he transforms us. And people start noticing something's happening in your life. What's the change about? It's the Spirit of God at work in our lives. I like what Marvin uh, Pate points out. He says, Mary calls attention to the great reversal that has occurred in her life. God has removed her from obscurity and a lowly status to the pinnacle of being exalted by all future generations. The reason for such blessing on Mary is not due to her own worthiness, but rather because of the greatness of the Son. Isn't that beautiful? So the focus now should move from Mary to Christ. And that's where it needs to go, folks. You know, we, we honor Mary. I'm not negating how amazing this young woman was. We're not negating her. We're not dishonoring her. No, we honor her, but the focus shouldn't remain on her. The focus should be moving towards the greater one, which is the Lord Jesus Christ. He's the star of the show. We need to see that. In Luke chapter 1, verse 48, she says, for he has been mindful of the humble state of his servant. From now on, all generations will call me blessed. They'll say, you were fortunate. You were, you were you know, a very favored person by God to have this honor. And then, for the mighty one has done great things for me. Holy is his name. Can I just say this? If you and I receive Christ, the mighty one has done great things for you. The mighty one has done great things for me. Isn't that beautiful? We can sing the song. And I keep saying this over and over again. What, what did Mary do to deserve the special calling or task? And I put the answer, nothing. God just picked her, you see? And that's what he does with us. He, he takes us, obscure people, and he goes, I'm going to choose you and you and you and you and you and you and you. I'm going to do all these things. You go, really? Why would you pick me? So you don't, you don't walk around afterwards and go, look how great I am. Hey, I want to just point out to you, we're little clay pots, the treasures inside of us. You see, that's what Paul says. So don't get too excited about how great you are. It's how great he is in you. And that should keep us humble. We should recognize that without him, we can do absolutely nothing. It's what Christ is doing in and through us. It's Christ. Uh, look where he reached out to receive us from. I love this, Psalm 40, verses 2 and 3. He lifted me out of the slimy pit, out of the mud and mire. Isn't that a graphic image? You like that poetry? God took us out of the slime pit of hell, out of the muck of sin, and he set our feet on a rock. You know, what rock? Christ. Christ is the rock. And he's set my feet on a rock, and he gave me a firm place to stand. He put a new song in my mouth. Do you have a song in your mouth? Do you have a song in your heart? You know, I don't get it when people come to church and just sit here like this and don't do anything. I go, what's their problem? I mean, man, I can, I don't know if you notice it. I kind of get into it. Does anybody kind of notice I get into worshiping God? See, I believe we're to worship God with all of our heart, soul, mind, and strength. I, I believe that our body should get into it. I mean, I've read the Bible. It says, lift up holy hands. It says, clap your hands, all you people. It says, dance unto the Lord. Man, I'm just grooving back here in the first row. You guys are going, what's with the pastor, you know? You, you know, you, you think it's just a little, I'm like the little kids. Have you noticed? You, how many have noticed we get little kids coming down here? They're probably probably two and a half years old, and they're boogieing down here. Has anybody seen that in our church? And then you look, and there's the pastor. He's well over 60, and he's just, he's just with them, you know? What's going on? You're going, what are you doing, pastor? I am worshiping God with all that is within me. I'm having a blast. I'm enjoying his presence. I recognize who he is, you know? I'm enjoying him. So I'm just inviting you, join the party. Woohoo! Let's go, guys. Yeah, we can sing and worship and have a good time. I think the church should be the greatest place to enjoy the presence of the greatest person. This is better than any rock concert. This is better than any dance or any contest. This is the most amazing place. We ought to come every Sunday going, I can hardly wait to come. I've got my dancing shoes on. You know, I am ready to go, Lord. I've been prayed up. I am, I am tuned up. I am ready to worship you with all my heart with my brothers and sisters. Hey, that's right. We have a song to sing. Yeah. 
Ephesians says this, and God raised us up with Christ and seated us with him in the heavenly realms in Christ Jesus. Do you realize that you and I are ruling and reigning with Christ? See, I don't think we understand who we are. I think if we got a little deeper understanding, we'd be getting more excited all the time. You know, that's why we need to know the word of God. It'll do something for you. You know, I love the story of the wealthy father and his son. They love to collect rare pieces of art. Man, they had everything from Picassos to Raphael's. And when the Vietnam conflict broke out, the son went to war, and unfortunately, he died in battle while rescuing another soldier. The father was deeply grieved. And he was grieving for his son when months later, a knock came at the door, and a young man stood there with a large package in his hand. He said, sir, you don't know me, but I'm the soldier for whom your son gave his life to save. He saved many lives that day, and when he was carrying me to safety, a bullet struck him, and he died instantly. And he'd often talked about you and your love for art. And the young man held out a package, and he said, I know this isn't much. I'm not a great artist, but I think your son would have wanted you to have this. And the father opened the package and gazed at the portrait of his son. And he stood in awe at the way the soldier had captured this painting of his son. And the father hung that that, that painting over the mantle. And when visitors came to his home, he would always draw attention to the portrait of his son before he'd show him any other piece of art. And when the father died, his paintings were to be auctioned, and many influential people with a lot of resources came because they wanted the the Picassos and the Raphaels and all those other great paintings. And on the platform sat the painting of his son, and the auctioneer pounded his gavel and asked for someone to start the bidding, and the crowd was scoffing. They said, where's the Van Goghs? Where's the Rembrandts? And the auctioneer persisted, who will start the bidding? $200, $100. And the crowd again insisted on seeing the famous paintings. And still the auctioneer solicited, the son, the son, who will take the son? And finally a voice said, I'll give $10 for the painting. The longtime gardener of the father who was relatively poor, couldn't afford much, and the auctioneer continued to pursue a higher bid. The crowd became angry. The auctioneer pounded the gavel and sold the painting for $10 to the gardener. An eager buyer from the second row bellowed, finally, let's get on with this auction. But the auctioneer said, I'm so sorry to tell you, the auction is over. When I was called to conduct this auction, I was told of a secret stipulation in the will. I was not allowed to reveal that stipulation until the painting of the sun was sold. And whoever bought that painting would inherit the entire estate and all of its paintings. The man who took the sun got everything. What's true of us when we receive the Son of God, when we receive Jesus, we get everything. He's the one that lifts us up. We're the ones who gain the entire inheritance. Do you know that we're joint heirs with Christ? Wow. Everything the Father has given his Son, you and I are now receiving as well. How many think that's amazing? Just get the Son. Just take the Son. With the Son comes everything. Let me move to the final reason for seeing, and it's our regarding God's provision for us. We're not exalted because of something we've done. It's because of who He is. It's because of His nature, His love, His mercy, His goodness that we're exalted. The greatest gift that God can give us and the greatest gift that you can receive is the gift of someone. You see, you and I can give a part of ourselves, some of our time, some of our energy, some of our expertise, but ultimately the greatest gift is the gift of ourselves. And when God came to earth, he didn't just give us something. He gave us himself. He gave us the greatest gift. And here we have a number of expressions of God's nature that Mary's song covers. She sings of God's mercy, his holiness, his power, his provisions, his faithfulness. What is also exciting is that God helps those who cannot help themselves. How many are happy about that? When you and I are weak and unable, God says, I know, I'm going to help you. I'm going to save you. I'm going to deliver you from your bondage. I'm going to deliver you from your state of spiritual death. I'm going to raise you to life. I'm going to bring you into my family. I'm going to give you a forever life with me in all of eternity. Wow. I love that. Warren Worsby says, the common people of that day were almost helpless when it came to justice and civil rights. It's true. They were often hungry, downtrodden, and discouraged, and there was no way for them to fight the system. How many have ever felt a little frustrated? Maybe the system seems overwhelming. And you know, we got people today, they're so upset, they're so frustrated, they're so irritated, and just like the Jewish people of that day, some of them break into a position that I'm going to fight the system, like the zealots. 
But you know, the zealots, that was a secret society, uh, used violent means to oppose Rome. But you know what the problem was? Their activities made things only worse. Isn't that the truth? You know, when we do the wrong things, and we do the rebellious things, and we do the evil things, and we just do those things, we never overcome in the end. We're overcome by evil. And that's exactly what happened. Unfortunately, study Jewish history. 70 AD, you know, they rebelled against Rome from 66 to 73 AD, and they were totally annihilated. They were really crushed, and then later on, the second great rebellion in 132 to 135, again, crushed by Rome. Isn't that sad? You know, wow. That's so true in our lives when we rebel against those that have greater power than we do. So what do we just, what do we just say about the attributes that Mary sung about? Let me just point out at least five of them here. First of all, God's holiness. Verse 49, for the mighty one has done great things for me. Holy is his name. What is holiness? Holiness speaks to the fact that God is distinctly other than us. He's not like us. I know we're made in his image, but he's transcendent. What does that mean? He's beyond us. He's incapable of our understanding. He's omnipresent. He's everywhere present at one time. He's all-powerful, all-knowing. He's just, I mean, he's God. You know, we want to bring him down to our size. We want to think that God is like us. Can I tell you, God is not totally like us at all. We have to be careful sometimes as Christians that we try to squeeze God in our little box. He doesn't quite fit, folks. You know, I would say let your soul expand. You know, take in more of God. See what happens to your soul. But in Christ, he's come to us. Then there's God's mercy, verse 50. He ex- his mercy extends to those who fear him from generation to generation. You know, mercy means receiving, no, oh, sorry, not receiving what we deserve. We're rebels. We're sinners. We're haughty. We're arrogant. We've neglected God. We've done our own thing. We'll do our own way. You know, we're like Frank Sinatra. I'll do it my way, you know. And that's what our society has done. Look how the mess we've gotten ourselves in. But the creator steps into his creation and saves us from ourselves and our sin. Then there's God's power. He has performed his mighty deeds with his arm. He has scattered those who are proud in their innermost thoughts. He has brought down rulers from their thrones, but has lifted up the humble. I love that. God reaches down to us who are unable to help ourselves and rescues us and then lifts us up. Isn't that beautiful? I love that. God's provisions. He has filled the hungry with good things and he has sent the rich away empty. God has given this amazing gift called salvation and brings honor and dignity into our lives by moving the sin, the guilt, and the shame. And then there's God's faithfulness. He has helped his servant Israel, remembering to be merciful to Abraham and his descendants forever, just as he promised our ancestors. God is faithful. I love that. God is faithful in doing what he promises. What God says, he will do. You know why God can do that? First of all, he's God. You and I can make all the promises we want. We're not capable all the time of fulfilling them because guess what? We're weak. We're limited. We can come to an end. We can have a liability. We can be diseased. We can have an accident. You know, things can hinder us, keep us from doing what we said we would do. Isn't that true? But God can do all of these things. And listen to this. I love what Titus says. There's one thing God cannot do, and that's lie. That would be against the intrinsic nature of who he is. God is the truth. And when he says something, it's true. And so you and I can bank our very souls on it. You can bank our eternity on it. As a matter of fact, he says, heaven and earth will pass away. Everything you see is going to be gone one day, but my words will abide forever. That's the most profound thought. That's why you can camp on God's word and put your life right there. But let me close with this illustration. In his book, Don't Waste Your Life, John Piper recounts a story. His dad was a Baptist evangelist. It's a story of a man who came to saving faith in Christ near the end of his earthly existence. As Piper tells the story, the church had prayed for this man for decades. You know how some of these small town churches are. They know everybody in town. They're praying for the the, the toughest nut, you know, the guy that's the most resistant to the gospel. But for some reason, he showed up one Sunday when they had the guest evangelist, which happened to be John's dad, and he was preaching. And at the end of the service, during a hymn, to everyone's amazement, he came forward and he took his dad's hand and sat down with him on the front pew of the church as people were leaving. And God opened his heart to the gospel of Jesus Christ, and he received Christ and forgiveness for sins, and he received eternal life. 
But that didn't stop him. He was sobbing and saying, as tears were running down his wrinkled face, I've wasted it. I've wasted it. What was he saying? I've wasted my life. But the grace of God, even a life that is almost totally wasted, can still be redeemed. And I like what Thomas Boston once said, our present existence is only a short preface to a long eternity. If that is true, then the man's life was not wasted after all. He was only just beginning an eternal life of endless praise. But why wait even a moment longer before starting to serve Jesus? You have only one life to live. Don't waste it by living for yourself when you can use it instead for the glory of God. Isn't that beautiful? It's never too late. It's never too late to begin a life of surrender to God. It's never too late to begin the song of praise that Mary celebrated as Jesus was going to be her Savior, the one who exalts, the one who provides according to his nature. And on the other hand, don't waste a moment of living for the smallest object of self when we can be living for the greatest object of life, namely serving God. Only then will we have the song of the season within our soul. Let's stand. I don't know about you, but I think this year we should be the greatest singers. I think this year we should be so full of the Holy Ghost, we should so be full of song that everybody that's whining and moping and defeated and deflated, is there a few folks out like that? Is there anybody out there like that? Pastor, don't talk about me right now. I'm just teasing you. But isn't that the truth? Do you not realize that if you have received Christ into your life, you have the spirit of the living God in you, and you have a reason for the season. You have a song in your heart. Let's begin to sing it. Let's begin to sing it. Amen? We should be the greatest of singers. We should be bringing the presence of the living God into the stores. If you're working still in your place of employment, you should be bringing God's presence to your neighbors, to your family members. How many see it? You and I are bringing God's presence there. But maybe you're here today and you say, man, I, I, I can't even do that, Pastor, because I don't know him. But I go back to that story of the auctioneer. If you have the son, you have everything. If you receive Jesus Christ as your Lord and Savior, I'll tell you right now, you will receive eternal life. What an amazing thing that is. What an incredible gift. You will be ruling and reigning with Christ. You will be actually joining him in a union that we liken on earth to marriage. You will become an, an intimate relationship with God. Isn't that powerful? You and I become his bride. Jesus Christ is the groom. That's what the story's all about, folks, if you don't know it. From the beginning of time in the book of Genesis, when paradise was lost, till you go all the way to the book of Revelation, when actually a city comes down, it's called heaven, comes down to earth. And actually this becomes a new earth. Isn't that beautiful? Can you see the beautiful poetry and symmetry of the whole Bible? It brings you right to the end where we're now unified with God forever. And all sin has been dealt with. And so you and I are no longer dealing with the struggles within our own soul, and there's no sin in anyone's life now. We're all totally free from the great element called sin, which brings disease and death and brings sorrow and heartache and misunderstanding and broken relationships. How many think that's going to be an amazing day? I'm looking forward to that day. Aren't you looking forward to that day? You know, we can be walking around high-fiving people. I, you know, as you get a little older, you keep losing your friends. But they're, we're not losing them. They're just, they're, just, they're just lining up. You know, I can just imagine one day when we finally get to the end, the Lord says, I'm taking you home today. And we can just run down that gamut of saints and we're high-fiving all the way through. Woo-hoo! I made it, right? Isn't that awesome? Isn't that a great day? We'll be high-fiving all the way down. Then there'll be Jesus at the end. We'll just throw ourselves down at him and say, Lord, I'm not worthy. I am not worthy. And Jesus will just grab us. Because I see the picture. The product, so he'll just pick us up, grab us, and hug us. And say, welcome home, my son. Welcome home, my daughter. Won't that be a great day? That'll be an awesome day. But maybe you're not there yet. You don't know him. But today's your day. 
The Spirit of God's been speaking into your heart this morning. You're beginning to see it. Oh, I get a glimpse of it. I'm catching on. I get it now. I can actually receive this gift into my life. The answer is absolutely. And just with every head bowed right now, let's pray. If you're here this morning, you just make this your prayer. Just say, Father in heaven, I ask you right now to forgive me for I have sinned against you. I've lived a self-sufficient, self-reliant, independent life of you. And I ask you to forgive me. I ask you to cleanse me from my sin and shame. I ask you to set me free. I ask you today that you will be my Lord and my Savior. I surrender my life. I give my life to you. And from this day forward, I will serve you the rest of my life. I thank you for hearing my cry. I thank you for setting my feet on this rock called Jesus. I receive you now. And I accept this amazing gift of eternal life because I'm receiving you, Jesus, and everything that comes with you. In Jesus' name, amen. Amen. If that's been your prayer, that was the cry of your heart. God heard that prayer. And from this moment on, something happened to you, something supernatural. God was birthed in your heart. Isn't that beautiful? That's what Jesus was talking about, being born again. You are now experiencing that in your life. God bless you as you leave this week. I'm looking forward to Christmas Eve. God bless you. Thanks again for joining us this morning. We've loved having you. Once again, we do want to get in touch with you. We want to hear from you. So go ahead, follow that link to our church website and click the Get Connected button and we'll get in contact with you. And you can give from that same place. Thank you so much for being here this morning. Be blessed.